10, 9, Good evening and welcome to the wonderful world of chemistry, a magic show. My name is Neil A. Hazari. I'm from Australia. That's why I sound funny. And tonight, it's my pleasure to be with you, to host you, as we take you through an educational journey in chemistry, which will include many demonstrations. Let me start by saying at the outset, the people who are doing these demonstrations are trained experts. You should not try any of these demonstrations at home. It will be hazardous to your health. So the question becomes, who are these people who are going to do the demonstrations for you this evening? If I'm going to introduce my team, I need some music. <laughs> so we have, from Florida, a person who loves her pet bunny, Emily Bath. We have, from Massachusetts, a person who is the greatest cornhole player in the world, David. Charbonneau. We have from Ohio a person who on his birthday wants to sit by himself and read a book from cover to cover, Nicholas Smith. We have a Yale undergraduate, a senior who likes to wear his younger sister's clothes, Vivek Suri. From New Jersey, we have a person who loves colours. She loves to talk, Julia Curley. From North Carolina, we have Yale undergraduate, Vivek Jack MacArthur. And finally, we have another person from Florida, a person whose pet cat loves to play with Emily's pet bunny, Matthew Espinoza. And you see, ladies and gentlemen, you don't know any of these people. None of these people are famous. And part of the reason they are not famous is because chemists and scientists in society are not famous. But I can tell you that if these people were basketballers in a few years' time, they would be like LeBron James or Diana Taurasi. If these people were movie stars, they would be Leonardo DiCaprio, Anne Hathaway. If they were musicians, they would be Ed Sheeran or Katy Perry. But because we don't value science in the same way as entertainers, they will work in a very quiet way to make your life and the person in the back's life and my life better for the next 30 years of their lives. So, So we've introduced the team. Before we start with any demonstrations, this event is about chemistry. And we need to introduce chemistry to you. And the question becomes, what is chemistry? Chemistry investigates the composition, properties, and behavior 
of matter. So of all of those words, the one you might be unfamiliar with is matter. What is matter? Matter is anything that occupies space and has weight. So look around this room. Pretty much everything you can think of fulfills that description. Vivek's hat, this bit of tape, the seat you're sitting on. So chemistry involves understanding everything that around us. And this matter is made from objects which are known as atoms. How should you think about atoms? Well, we have approximately 120 different types of atoms which are represented by the periodic table. And atoms are like letters in words. We can combine atoms to make molecules, just like we can combine letters to make words. And all of the different elements have different properties. And they have different properties because they have a different number of what are known as protons, neutrons, and electrons. To do our first demonstration of the evening, which involves understanding the properties of different atoms, please welcome Matthew Espinoza. Hi everyone. So as Neelay said, all elements are unique. And so this leads to them all having different properties. Since they have different properties, we can use those differences to distinguish one element from another. So one example of this is when you heat up an element to very high temperatures, they give off different colors. And so you've actually seen this if you've been out on July 4th and you've seen fireworks going off, all those bright red colors, green colors that you see coming off of the uh, fireworks are due to the extreme heat and the colors are coming off of those elements which are heated and getting excited. So for today's demonstration, what we're gonna do is heat up a bunch of different elements to high temperatures and show off those colors. So as a bonus, if you remember some of the colors for the elements, you might win a prize in Nick's demonstration, which is coming up. So Neela, can you play the appropriate background music for me? Thank you. So this first element is copper. Does anyone want to guess what color it is? Copper gives off a green color. Next is sodium. Any guesses? Yellow's a great guess. Does anyone know what you do to a dead chemist? You bury him. And that's the next element. Next is potassium. Any guesses? So potassium gave us a purple color. Next is strontium. Any guesses? <laughs> Lastly, we have lithium. Any guesses? Thank you, everyone. Now, to challenge you, did you pay attention during that demonstration? We're going to have a competition. Nick is going to burn something for you. And you're going to have to tell us what is the element that's being burnt. All right, so as Neelay just said, it's quiz time here at Yale. All right, so I've got here two syringes full of liquid, and I'm just going to add them here to this solid. And I'm going to step away for a moment here. And in just a moment, you'll see the two very highly reactive chemicals that I just combined catch on fire, and they'll provide a nice color for you. And you can guess then what element is providing the flame.
Ah, there it goes. It's just starting off. All right, so if you think you know what it is, just shout it out. Nile, do you want to be the judge of this? Somewhere, someone over there said the right element. The right element is potassium. Nick, you can give them their prize. We have well, one very... Yes. Congratulations. Congratulations. There you go. Congratulations. <laughs> okay, so we've described to you what chemistry is. The next question might be, why should you care about chemistry? Well, the simple reason you should care about chemistry is chemistry has made some of the most profound contributions to your quality of life. Things that chemistry impacts include pharmaceuticals, solar panels, toys like my favorite, the rubber ducky, paints, cosmetics, Plastics, the person up the back who's currently looking at everything on their iPhone. Chemistry was part of the reason we can have iPhones because of computer chips. But I know we have some young people in this audience. And young people, they don't like hearing from old fogies like me. Instead, they want to get their information from people who are the stars of social media. So I added up who is the person in the world with the most followers on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, and all these other things I've never heard of. And who has the most followers? Zuckerberg. Anyone, anyone have any other thoughts? Bill Gates. OK, well, I will tell you the answer. And I will show you that that person in fact loves chemistry. That person is your favorite and my favorite, Taylor Swift. And so to show you that Taylor Swift loves chemistry, let's look at this video clip of Taylor Swift. Look at what Taylor Swift is wearing. Taylor Swift is wearing the periodic table. Look at that. You might say, this was one freak video and that Taylor Swift was trying to be a nerd. So she pretended that she liked chemistry. So I'm going to show you more evidence that Taylor Swift loves chemistry. Emily? She's again pining about her lost love interest and she's doing chemistry. Look at her. She's in the lab doing chemistry. She's not doing it safely, she's not wearing gloves, and things go wrong. So what I have given you is two compelling reasons why chemistry is important. It's everywhere, and Taylor Swift loves chemistry. <laughs> now, I said earlier that we use the atoms to make molecules, just like we use letters to make words. What can we make by combining atoms? We can make a very topical molecule, which is bad for our environment, like carbon dioxide, by combining two oxygens and one carbon. We can make water by combining two hydrogens and one oxygen. We can make methane, which you'll see later on tonight, by combining four hydrogens and one carbon. Just like we have simple words, we have more complicated words if we combine more letters. We can do the same with molecules. If I combine more atoms, this array of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen, I can make the molecule that all your parents need to get them through the day, caffeine. If I am sick, I can make a molecule which will kill bacteria, namely penicillin, 
which has carbon, oxygen, sulfur, nitrogen. And these connections between the atoms are known as bonds. Now, the different molecules and indeed the different elements exist in different phases. And you are familiar with those phases. Let's think about water. When it's really cold outside, water exists as a solid in the form of ice. When it's a nice day, like in fall, we will get water in the form of a liquid. And when we heat water, we get steam. And in fact, all molecules and atoms can exist in these three phases. To do a demonstration that shows us about molecules and atoms interconverting between the phases, Please welcome Jack, Vivek, and Dave. Okay, hello. For this next demonstration, we're going to be, mix we're going to be mixing two things, nitrogen and water. Now, does anyone know what state nitrogen is generally found in? If you said gas, you're correct. Approximately 75% of the air that we breathe is made of nitrogen. Now, if you cool nitrogen to a really, really low temperature, you'll get it to condense into a liquid, as you're about to see Dave pour. Now, as Neelay mentioned, when it's really cold outside, like it has been in New Haven, water turns into ice, which we find in snow and all over the ground. So when you get above 32 degrees, water turns from solid water into liquid water. Now, that happens at 32 degrees. Does anybody know the temperature at which water boils when it turns from a liquid into a gas? Shout it out. 100 degrees Celsius, yeah. So zero degrees to freeze and 100 degrees Celsius to boil. Now, liquid nitrogen, as we see over here, is super, super cold. And the temperature where it turns from a liquid into a gas is really low. Can I hear some guesses as to how low the temperature for liquid nitrogen to boil is? Lower. Negative 200 degrees is how cold this right here liquid nitrogen is. And so if we take boiling liquid water, which is at 100 degrees Celsius, and we add it to this liquid nitrogen at negative 200 degrees, a lot of energy is going to be transferred really fast, and we're going to see something very exciting. Are you guys ready for that? Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. You need to get right, spoken. Okay, did you like that one? It's one of my favorites as well. Now, I've put another molecule up on the board. Does anyone know what molecule this is? Any guesses? Shout it out. Sugar, that's right. If you like chocolate, if you like candy, this molecule is the active ingredient of those uh, things we eat. And to do a demonstration involving sugar, please welcome Dave Charbonneau. All right, thank you, Niwe. So in my hand, I have a container of cotton candy. As Nilay mentioned, cotton candy is primarily comprised of sugar or sucrose. Typically, when we see cotton candy, we think about it in the solid state, as it's appeared here. In the solid state, the sucrose molecules are surrounded by other sucrose molecules. However, what would happen if we introduced a solid, like sucrose, into a liquid such as water? It would melt, that's a guess. Anyone else? It would evaporate. It would evaporate, there's another one. 
Okay, so to begin our investigation, I figured we could watch a short yet informative video clip of a raccoon who has been given a piece of cotton candy. So let's see what happens. Okay, so what happened is the solid dissolved, exactly, thank you. So the raccoon didn't have the type of chemistry knowledge that we're learning here today. It dunked its cotton candy into the liquid water and then the cotton candy appeared to just disappear, leaving a very sad and confused raccoon. <laughs> So, when the cotton candy goes into the water, as we say, dissolves, the cotton candy, the sucrose, the molecules are still intact. No bonds were broken. However, the sucrose molecules are now just surrounded by water molecules instead of other sucrose molecules, as we would think of it in the solid state. So, different solids can dissolve uh, in different liquids and only a certain amount of each solid can go into any given volume of a liquid. So I figured we could do a quick demonstration to see just how much cotton candy can dissolve in water. But before we do that, Nile, do you happen to like cotton candy? Dave, I love cotton candy. That's excellent, Nile. And a follow-up question. How much cotton candy do you think will fit into this small volume of water? Oh, Dave, I think you're smarter than a raccoon, so I think you're going to be able to do maybe one and a half of those tubs. Okay, one and a half of these tubs. Well, you know what, Nile, since you like cotton candy so much, whatever doesn't dissolve, you can keep. Yeah? Does that seem fair? Okay, let's see how this goes. One down, Nile. <laughs> Not looking so good. Two down. That's easy. Three down. Four. Five down, Nile. Should I give him the last one? No. <laughs> Six tubs of cotton candy into this small volume of water. So now let's check uh, back in with our raccoon friend and see if it was paying attention to the lecture. Hey! So, I'm not that heartless, and just like the raccoon, we want Nile to be happy as well. So I got him his very own tub of cotton candy. What's up, Max? All right, thanks, Dave. I am feeling generous. I think that uh, you right here would like to have some cotton candy. So here you go, but don't put it in water. Okay, earlier on we defined matter and we said that all matter has mass and actually all atoms have mass and the different atoms have different masses. So potassium has a different mass to sodium, to carbon, to hydrogen and as a consequence all molecules have mass. Let me ask you a question. What has a larger mass? One feather or one brick? A feather is heavier than a brick? <laughs> so a brick is heavier than a feather. And the reason a brick is heavier than a feather is because of a concept called density. And density is mass per unit volume. 
Okay, so in the same volume of a brick, it's going to weigh a lot more than the same volume of a feather because it's more dense. And we are scientists. So I'm going to ask you a question. Do gases have density? What do people think? Okay, so I hear some people say yes, and I hear some people say no. So what do we need to do? We need to do an experiment. And to do that experiment, please welcome Nick and Matt. All right, Neelay. Well, uh, thank you for that. But uh, before we get to the experiment, uh, Neelay, we wanted to ask you a quick question. What's your favorite Disney movie? Aladdin. Has to be Aladdin. Aladdin, okay. Uh, who's your favorite character in that film? The genie from the lamp. The genie from the lamp. Well, Matt, does that remind you of anything? Yeah, every time I think of genie, I can always think of one phrase. Right when he appears, all I can think of him is saying, <sighs> Unlimited cosmic power! Oh! <laughs> <laughs> Itty bitty living space. Ba la ba. Ba ba. Ba la ba. Ba ba da. All right. So now that uh, we have done that little ditty for you all, um, let's explain what was happening. So Matt, when he was, made his voice sound really deep, what he did was he had a balloon full of a gas called sulfur hexafluoride. And when you breathe it in, your voice sounds like this. So Nick inhaled SF6, which is a very heavy gas. Instead, in my hand, I have helium. So this is, what the, this is the gas Nick initially inhaled, and as you can see, it's lighter than air. That's why it floats when you have a balloon from, say, the zoo. So when I inhale this... My voice sounds like this. I sound like a second grader. <laughs> and the reason this is happening is because this gas is lighter and so it passes through my vocal cords much faster. <laughs> All right, so just one more bit of evidence if we haven't convinced you that uh, sulfur hexafluoride is more dense than helium. We have here one more balloon full of sulfur hexafluoride. And we have a balloon of helium that I will not let go because then it will be up at the top of the ceiling for the next three weeks. <laughs> All right, so thank you. So far in tonight's presentation, all we have done is we have changed molecules and atoms from one phase to another, or we have inhaled them but we haven't done my favorite part of chemistry, which is to do chemical reactions. So what we do in a chemical reaction is we can take, say, molecule A and molecule B, and we can make two new molecules, C and D. What is an example of that? Was anyone excited when at the start of this show we ignited those balloons? That was a chemical reaction. And the chemical reaction that was occurring was that one molecule of hydrogen, H2, was reacting with half an equivalent of O2 to make water, which is H2O. And chemical reactions, as I will describe to you in subsequent slides, are extremely important in everyday life. 
However, not only are they extremely important, they are also often aesthetically extremely pleasant to watch. Emily is going to do an unusual chemical reaction for you now. Thanks, Nile. So one of the things that I think is so cool about chemistry is just how tiny atoms and molecules are. They're so tiny, I can't believe it. But the problem is that when we want to do a chemical reaction, we're breaking bonds and making bonds, and because they're so tiny, we can't actually see what's going on. So we have to come up with other ways to do that. So one way that we can do that is by using something called an indicator. An indicator is a compound that changes color when a certain reaction is happening or when a specific chemical is present. So in this beaker, I have a source of iodine. And I'm going to pour in a solution of starch. And starch is an indicator for iodine. How do we get the microphone set? So no color change yet, but we're going to watch this chemical reaction happen when I add a solution of hydrogen peroxide. Maybe I'm just going to stand next to you. So if you watch closely, you'll see that the solution is changing colors. And so the reason that that's happening is because the amount of iodine that's in the solution is constantly changing, which we wouldn't be able to know if we didn't have the indicator. And as Neelay said, it's also really nice to look at. One of the areas where chemical reactions are extremely important is in energy. We all need energy for our daily lives. Almost all of you came to this venue somehow. Probably you were in a car, and in the car you did a chemical reaction involving oil to get here. Some of you, I'm sure, like to cook. When you're cooking, you do a chemical reaction which involves natural gas. And similarly, sometimes we use coal to generate energy. Now, all of these energy sources release carbon dioxide, as we'll explain in a subsequent slide, which is bad for our environment. And we would like to use renewable energy sources, such as wind, biofuels, or the sun. To use these types of renewable energy sources, we will also need to do chemical reactions. Now those chemical reactions are often quite complex. So we're going to illustrate how we get energy from using fossil fuels, which is what we predominantly do today. And the type of reaction that we predominantly do is a combustion reaction. That's what you saw at the start of the show when we burnt those hydrogen balloons. Another type of combustion reaction involves taking methane, which is natural gas, it's what's probably lighting your stove, and two molecules of oxygen, and you will make water and also this molecule of CO2, which is bad for the environment. Why do we get energy from this reaction. It's because the bonds broken contain more energy, so the CH bond in methane or the O2 bond in oxygen contains more energy overall than the bonds made in carbon dioxide and water. And as a result, the excess energy is released as heat. We are now going to do a demonstration which involves burning methane. And later on in this demonstration, I need a volunteer from the crowd. Is anyone willing to uh, be a volunteer? So I'm feeling lazy, so I'm not going to walk very far. You, my friend, are probably too young. I'm sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to choose the person with the blonde hair here. And I am going to talk to her while Vivek Emily and Matt start this demonstration for the rest of you. Thanks, everyone. 
So as Nile just mentioned, uh, for this demonstration, what we're going to do is we're going to burn methane. So methane, or natural gas, um, burns at actually a really hot temperature. Does anyone want to guess what temperature it burns at? Higher. I'm talking about Fahrenheit, so we're thinking high. Methane burns at 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit at its hottest temperature. Now that's really hot. And what we're going to do today is collect methane in bubbles and burn it on our hands. That's kind of crazy. I mean, this is what you're cooking with. This is used even as a rocket fuel. I don't know about you. I don't want to stick my hand behind a rocket. That doesn't sound great to me. Um, so. Matt, that sounds ridiculous. How are you going to protect your hands? Yeah, I've been thinking about this actually for a while, since last year. Um, fortunately, I got some great suggestions last year from the audience. One of them was buy fake hands. Um, <laughs> and so I looked that up on Amazon. They're pretty expensive. Uh, so instead, I thought of a better idea. Instead, I'll have my good friend Vivek risk his life and burn his hands instead. So here you go, Vivek. This is all you. Thank you very much. But fortunately, I am not afraid of how hot the methane oh, sorry, is going to be because I have a plan. I'm going to protect my hands with something really common, and that's water. Water has this great quality called the specific heat capacity, and water has a really high specific heat capacity, which means it can absorb a lot of the heat from the methane. So if I cover my hands in water before I put the methane and light it on fire on my hands, I will be perfectly safe. So right now, Vivek is just uh, capturing the bubbles of methane, which are coming off. He's dipped his hands in water, and now Emily is going to ignite the methane. Now, guys, I thought, that was okay, but it's really not as big as some of the demonstrations that we've done today. And this is why we need a volunteer. Because <laughs> uh, we've, already, we've got our volunteer, and you can see that we have equipped her in personal protective equipment so that she doesn't get hurt. She has a lab coat, she has her safety glasses, and now what we're going to have her do is we're going to have her dip her hands in this water to protect herself. She's going to start bubbling the methane. And Vivek is going to start dipping his hands in the water. And then you're going to go and collect some of these methane bubbles together. And so if we have four sets of hands, we should have many more methane bubbles than when we just had Vivek's set of hands by himself. Okay, and they're going to come out in front of the stage and they're going to stand like this. So that they're holding their methane bubbles close to each other and then we're going to light them together. All right. So for our kind volunteer, we have some chocolate after she has removed her lab coat and her safety glasses. You can't eat uh, around uh, chemicals of this nature. So we're going to leave that there. We're going to thank our volunteer and thank Rebecca. <laughs> and we're going to talk about other forms of energy. So in this, or the experiment we just did, 
we released energy in the form of heat. But almost the biggest source of energy that we have comes in the form of light because the sun generates so much energy for this planet. And just like some chemical reactions release heat, some chemical reactions release light. And so Julia is going to do a chemical reaction which releases light. Thank you, Nile. Now, as Nile said at the beginning of the show, I really love colors. And so I was very excited to get to do a demonstration that shows you some colors today. Now, I have two flasks up here at the front. One is filled with luminol, which is a chemical that exhibits chemiluminescence. And now, chemiluminescence sounds like a fancy word, but all it really means is that when it reacts with molecules such as hydrogen peroxide, which is in the other flask, flask that I'm holding, it releases light, which is what luminescence means. So you see, when I mix these two things together, they make this beautiful blue color, which as you might guess from my hair, is one of my favorite colors in the world. This property is not just used in, in the chemistry lab, it's also found all the time in nature. So fireflies, which you see during the summer, use chemiluminescence to attract their mates when they light up. There are creatures in the sea that use chemiluminescence to deter prey from attacking them. And it also happens to be very pretty. <laughs> All right, let's thank Julia for that demonstration. Now, chemical reactions often don't happen spontaneously. We need to do something to initiate a chemical reaction. What are some examples of this? I am sure that there are people in this room who love to cook. When you cook, you're Food doesn't do anything quite often until you put in heat, right? You light a flame and then your food is made. Similarly, you can start a chemical reaction using light. Just like reactions release light, sometimes they can be initiated using light. We are going to do a chemical reaction which we need to initiate, which involves taking isopropanol, a common chemical that you might even have in your home, and oxygen, and making carbon dioxide and water. Here is the structure of isopropanol. It has carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and oxygen atoms. And this reaction won't go unless we give it some energy. I could leave isopropanol sitting in a bottle for years and nothing would happen until we give it some energy. Before we do the reaction, what type of reaction is this? Chemical reaction. Chemical reaction. So I want a more specific answer than a chemical reaction. Combustion. Combustion, there we go. You've got it, have some chocolate. And now Emily will do this demonstration for you. All right, thank you, Nile. So what I've just done is I put some isopropanol in this bottle and shook it around a little bit. So I wanted to get lots of vapors of isopropanol into the bottle. So right now, there's really no isopropanol in there, just the vapor. I'm just going to clamp it up here. And let's input some energy. Woo! Nice. So that worked pretty well. But um, I think we might be able to go bigger. What do you think? Can we go bigger? All right, let's see what we got here. I think that'll work. All right, so I'm just doing exactly the same thing, shaking it around, trying to get lots of vapors. And now I'm going to pour out the extra. I guess if we uh, really wanted to, we could fill the whole thing with isopropanol, but we're not going to do that. And this is a similar process to what takes place in your car in an internal combustion engine, um, igniting vapors, and that's what powers your car. So you're all familiar with this process, even if you haven't done it.
just trying to make sure I have all the isopropanol out. All right. Going to wipe off the top because I don't want any on the outside. All right, let's give this a try. Ready? Okay, thank you very much, Emily. So we've introduced you to different types of molecules tonight. One very important type of molecule is known as a polymer. And to, take, to make a polymer, we take one chemical and we repeat it over and over again, and we form connecting bonds between the repeating units. So we might take a molecule A and we will convert it to a strand of A prime, many units of A prime, which have a similar structure to A. What are some examples? So plastics are one of the most important examples of polymers. A compound such as polyethylene, which is this carbon and hydrogen containing molecule, can be polymerized to make a structure that looks like this. And that is in plastic bottles, which you see everywhere. Polymers are also crucial in biology. DNA, which encodes our genetic information, is a polymer. And the monomer units that encode DNA are not a single molecule, but four different molecules. And you combine these four molecules in lots of different ways, and you make different structures. Another important polymer is nylon. Nylon is in our clothes. You see that you can get long strands of nylon. To show you how easy it is to make a polymer, please welcome Julia and Dave. Thanks very much, Nile. All right, so as Nile was just saying, polymers are incredibly important in our everyday life, and especially nylon. Can you get the camera, please, Nick, so everyone can see? Great. Um, and so what I have here in these two small flasks are the two different monomers that make up a nylon polymer. And so I'm going to pour one gently on top of the other, and at the interface of the two solutions where they mix, we're going to hopefully get a nice polymer to start forming, which you'll all be able to see. So if I just let that mix for a moment and let our polymer start to form. You see that from these two clear solutions starts to form a solid, which I can pull out, and you see a strand of nylon. So Dave, could you give me a hand here? It looks like we're making quite a bit of stuff. I would love to, Julia. Go nice and slow. All right, and so nylon, is really useful. As Neelay said, it's used in a lot of clothing. It has some great properties. It's really stretchy, but also strong. It can be dyed in a variety of different colors, so you can buy clothes in whatever color you want. And as you can see, it's pretty easy to make. Dave, I think you can go a little further. Absolutely. I think you can keep going. <laughs> and so it's pretty easy to make and pretty fun. And uh, if we wanted to, we could probably dye this a fun color, and we could all knit us all a nice little sweater. <laughs> All right, well. Keep going, guys, keep going. <laughs> you think you can make it to the audience? Oh, we're certainly going to try. <laughs> Notice this thing is not breaking. It's incredibly, it's an incredibly long single strand. <laughs> yes, Vivek, yes, yeah, we might need some, some help. Give us some support here. We need some help. <laughs> keep going, keep going up the stairs, Dave. <laughs> All right, we're going to keep going up the stairs. We need more people. We need more right, people to help. Please, no one in the audience touch the molecules. You need to be wearing gloves in order to touch the polymer strand. Thank you. All right. Oh! oh. oh. All right. Thank you to all of my lovely assistants. Oh, my God. All right, just... 
put this in the beaker. So yep. guys, <laughs> just another right teaching there. model, teaching moment. We practiced this uh, two days ago, and two days ago, we could not get our bit of nylon past the edge of the table. And we were very worried it was going to be a disaster, but Julia went into lab and she practiced for many hours, and you can see how long her string of nylon was. Now, we said that you could initiate a chemical reaction using heat or using light. Sometimes the amount of heat that you have to put in to a chemical reaction to get it to start is simply too great for us to manage. If, say, we needed a reaction to go at 1,000 degrees Celsius, it's very difficult to control chemistry at those temperatures. So there is another way that we can do reactions that are otherwise difficult. And this is known as catalysis, where we add something called a catalyst to our reaction. And a catalyst is a really incredible molecule. Because what a catalyst does is I can put it into a reaction, it will cause a chemical reaction to occur, and then I can get the catalyst back at the end of the reaction. And we might have a chemical reaction which involves A plus B going to C or D. And we will get no reaction if we leave A and B to sit for 500 years. If we then add a catalyst to the reaction of A and B, in seconds at room temperature, we will make C and D. What's an example of this? So two slides ago, I told you that we could polymerize a molecule called ethylene to make polyethylene, which are plastics. If I have ethylene, which is a gas in a tank, nothing will happen to that ethylene. If I add a catalyst, I can make polyethylene in minutes at room temperature. So why are catalysts important? At the start of this presentation, I said, here is all of the things that chemistry can do. Well, it turns out that 90% of consumer products are made using a catalyst at some point in their synthesis. So without catalysts, all the toys that you know and love, as well as more practical items, would simply be too hard to make. To do a demonstration which highlights catalysis, please welcome Nick and Jack. Hi there, everybody. So as Nile said, we're going to show you a demonstration of catalysis now. And in doing so, we're going to answer the question that everybody in the room has been thinking about all night. How exactly is it that an elephant brushes their teeth? <laughs> the answer, of course, is with elephant toothpaste. And that's what the name of this demonstration is called. Now, you might have seen this before because recently uh, the oh, most recent winner of Miss, the Miss America competition did this demonstration as her talent. So if you like this demo, you can just refer to me as Mr. Yale 2020 from now on. <laughs> All right, but now on to the serious chemistry. So we have in each of these flasks a uh, mixture of hydrogen peroxide and a little bit of dye just for color. And hydrogen peroxide is a very unstable molecule. Now, over time, it will slowly decompose and turn itself into water and oxygen gas. But if we add a little bit of a catalyst, we'll make that reaction go much, much more quickly. 
And so that we can see it, we've also added in a little bit of soap to capture all of the bubbles that will be created. Jack is going to help me because I don't have four hands. And on the count of three, Jack? Mm -hmm. OK. One, two, three. <laughs> And there we have it, elephant toothpaste. <laughs> All right, everyone, you have been a wonderful audience tonight. And I would like to say that I hope today is just an introduction to your education in chemistry. Over the course of the year, through the Yale Pathways program, there will be many other activities that you can engage in. Today we've shown you the broad range of chemistry, but chemistry combines many different subfields. There's organic chemistry, which looks at the chemistry of carbon and hydrogen. There's inorganic chemistry, which looks at the chemistry of all the other 118 elements. And then, if tonight's presentation really scared you, there's theoretical chemistry, where you never need to do any experiments. <laughs> Before we finish tonight, I have some concluding comments, and we have one last uh, demonstration. Now, we titled this The Wonderful World of Chemistry, A Magic Show. But the reality is nothing in chemistry is magic. We can explain with the fundamental principles of science everything that we did tonight. And to me, learning about fundamental properties is incredibly inspiring because by understanding fundamental properties, we can make a profound difference to the way society operates. So to finish, I'm going to welcome back the team. We're going to have the lights brought on, and Matt is going to unfurl a banner. And this banner has a message on it, which you may or may not be able to see. But to really reveal the message, we're going to welcome back the team. So first up, Emily, and then Jack, and then Nick, and then Vivek, and then Dave. Spray away, guys. Make this message appear. So what we did on this bit of paper was a chemical reaction to make colour. And all of us believe that chem is cool and that is why we signed our names to this. Thank you very much and enjoy your evening. <laughs>